<clears throat> okay, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you this afternoon. First of all, I want to um, acknowledge my co-authors, Dana Ritter from the Queensland University of Technology. It's her work, uh, this good work that she's uh, done for her PhD, and also for, to uh, Lael Parrott from the University of British Columbia in Canada. As we know, regional NRM, managing within regional NRM is complex. We've got, it's a complex social ecological system, we've got people, we've got ecosystems, and we've got economics. And we also know, as been restated often here, the rate of change is occurring and the rate of change is in fact increasing. So what do we do? We say logically, we rationalise that what we need to help in this uh, changing space and in the decision making space, we need processes and tools to help us assess those policy and decisions that we make. However, when we have a look at the evidence for how well we're doing, it's not so terrific. We are still using engagement processes that we know are variably effective. We know that developing plans takes excessively long amount of time. We also know, when we go and talk to NRM regions, that the plans are very little used after they have been developed. And we also know that the tools that are developed, some of the processes and tools that are developed during that planning process, are rarely used after the event. So we're not doing so well. As Julia Sumner Miller said, well, why is it so? Obviously, let's go and find out. Let's ask the end users, which is rarely done. I've got two examples that we'll talk about. The uh, Landscape Futures Project uh, here in South Australia. So we're, it's a science-based project to look at future land options, how you might manage into the future, giving all this complexity. And we would aim to try and get that embedded into both the planning and the implementation process. So the tool we'll talk about is the Landscape Futures Analysis. It's an example of an environmental decision support system. The second example is to look at what happened in Canada with the Kimberley Climate Adaptation Project. And when you see what it was about, identify a range of potential climate impact impacts, assess the local vulnerability, develop adaptation strategies. And they had a tool which is very similar in the sense of bringing together lots of the spatial information, lots of models about what, how we can project what may, might happen into the future if we impose different kind of management and choose different ways of managing the landscape. Again, another example of an environmental decision support system. This is uh, what the user interface for the Landscape Futures Analysis tool looked like on the Eyre Peninsula. So it brings together a lot of the information about agriculture, biodiversity, carbon and weeds. And it, oops, back there you go. Uh, back, uh, it um, talks about within different climate scenarios, so making projections forward, and the prices and costs both of commodities, including carbon. The um, Canadian project was associated with this uh, Collaborative for Advanced Landscape Planning and the guys involved in that, Stephen Shepherd, they put a lot of effort into developing this guidance manual which talked about the processes and the tools that they used to make assessments of how the Kimberley community might manage and plan and manage into the future. Climate scenarios, carbon, land use, urban design and looking at those interactions, that complexity that we talked about and here's some tools that we've developed to help us deal with that complexity. So what do the end users think about the process? So this is Dana's intensive work going and interviewing lots of end users, those that were involved in these projects. What did you think? Well, they thought that the involvement with you know, the development of the tool and some of the process, they, they really liked that. They helped them uh, identify how they might change and adapt into the future. They thought that the tool that was developed was very useful overall. But again, once the project stopped, they did not go back and refer and use the tool, which it obviously embodies a heck of a lot of knowledge and understanding of what's going on. What about the South Australian example? Well, when you ask the end users, they really enjoyed the um, involvement with the process and they, they, there's evidence of clear capacity development and understanding what they're trying to manage. They thought that the environmental decision support system had really good value, and yet 
again, it was virtually, they acknowledged it was virtually abandoned after the completion of the project. And more than 50% of them thought it should have been used after uh, the end of the project. So what are the reasons? So we as researchers think, well, maybe it's not relevant, maybe it's too complicated, maybe we didn't have a, uh, adequate communication, maybe we just, they just didn't like us. Um, but what, are the, what do the end users say? They really like the scientific and technical element. That credibility is really important to them. And we certainly, as researchers, we, we certainly didn't communicate as well as we should have. What are the consequences once this project ends? In other words, there's not going to be any of the support that we can provide. So they thought that that, act, that communication was insufficient. They thought that the whole project, the time for learning, was grossly underestimated. They thought that there was a lack of organisational support and the need for people, champions, who are going to continue to promote the understanding and the tools that have been developed at great cost and energy. And there is need for additional promotion and ongoing support if we're going to realise uh, better and more enduring outcomes. So the learnings and to some extent the reinforcement of the things we know about this engagement process and the involvement between research and going into uh, the planning process and helping communities understand the complexity they've got and what are the opportunities they've got to think about new ways of doing things and managing their landscape into the future. We need to be clear about what it is we're doing, what we're about, who's involved and expect commitment. Having lots of uh, engaging early and often is really critical and at times we need to engage many and at other times you need to engage the few individual key influences. And it's very critical to decide when is it appropriate to engage widely and when is it appropriate to identify who are the key influences. Technical credibility is critical. Envisioning, which is a process that we worked on and developed, is very much about understanding and getting to what are the real values that this, real values that this community holds. What are the things that they have hold dear to their heart as important to them. And then we need to identify and, and support the champions. And the important bit about that is champions don't live forever. They don't get engaged forever. There is a turnover, so it's important to try and figure out how do you overcome that problem. So the reasons for the end users for these kind of, if you like, this failure to capitalise on the fabulous work that's been done. Failure for the researchers to follow up, and especially the lack of commitment from government agencies who support and influence the array of end users. 